Okay. So I would like to start by thanking Jean-Philippe for the invitation. It's uh, really nice to, to be here and uh, be able to speak in this nice event. Uh, so Jean-Philippe asked me to uh, talk a bit about constraint uh, satisfaction problems, and in particular, random uh, constraint satisfaction problems. And so this is a class of problems that, that has been studied a lot in, um, in the statistical physics, physics uh, community to, to which I, I belong, but also uh, in mathematics and in computer science. And the reason why I think Jean-Philippe and I wanted to bring this to, to your attention is that we hope that maybe they can also play a role in, in economics and, well, in, in also in other contexts. So, um, well, I mean, I mean, um, okay. So what I'm going to do um, is to start by explaining wh what is a constraint satisfaction problem. This is uh, probably something you already know, but uh, well, uh, I will be quick on that. And then I will introduce random uh, constraint satisfaction problems, and I will explain a little bit the kind of results that have been obtained uh, within the statistical physics uh, community uh, about phase transitions in these problems. And then I will try to explain why we hope that this kind of uh, phenomena can be uh, maybe useful in modeling uh, macro macroeconomic or other social systems. So, okay. Constraint satisfaction problems. So I will give you three examples um, instead of a general definition, which well, I mean, you have to satisfy some constraints. So I, I will give you some examples. So an example is the problem of coloring graphs. So you have a graph, you have nodes and links, and you want to put colors on the node, and, uh, and you have Q colors. For example, here three. So you have blue, red, and green. And you have N nodes, and you have M links connecting them. And the question is, can you assign a color to each node in such a way that you don't have links that connect to, to red nodes, for example, or to green nodes or to blue nodes? And so this is, a, um, is, it, this is called the decision problem because you have to decide if it's possible or not. So the, the, I, I give you a graph. I tell you how many colors you have. And then the answer is, yes, I can color it or no, I cannot color it. And so I'm going to call uh, satisfiable uh, an instance, so in this case, an instance is the graph. Okay, an instance of the problem is the graph in this case, and I, I will call it satisfiable or sat if the answer is, is yes or unsatisfiable if the answer is, is no. Um, so this is a second example on which I, I worked quite a lot is the problem of packing spheres in a volume. So you are given a volume, for example, I mean, this is a two-dimensional picture, but imagine a cubic box. And, um, okay, for simplicity, you can imagine that you have periodic boundaries, but this is not very important. So you have a, a, a box. Um, and you have n spheres in this box. And let's say, and then, and then you have some parameter delta. I will tell you what it is in a second. So, and then the question is, okay, I give you an initial configuration of the spheres. So the spheres are in some points. For example, I put them at random. I give you uh, the size of the spheres. And then I ask you, can you displace a little bit the spheres in such a way that you remove all the overlaps, okay? At the beginning, if, if you put the spheres at random, there will be some pairs of spheres that, that overlap. And I want to, to remove these overlaps by moving a little bit the, the spheres. And what, I mean, this parameter delta is just to give you some tolerance on, on the amount of movement that you can do, okay? So you can displace on average each sphere by delta with respect to its initial uh, condition. And okay, well, I mean, the reason why I'm introducing this initial con configuration is essentially to get rid of the crystal in this uh, game, in case you were wondering about that. Because I mean, if you don't put the, this, this, this tolerance, then you can always put the spheres in a, in a regular pattern, and, and this will be the best you, you can do. So I want to put some disorder in the problem. Um, well, so in this case, uh, the, the parameter that measures the difficulty of, of the problem, which in the case of the, of the coloring was the number of links, essentially. So the, the more you put links and the more it's difficult to, to, to color the graph. Here, here the, the parameter is the, is the um, packing fraction, which is the fraction of the volume of the box that is covered by the spheres when, when they don't overlap. So you can compute it easily, and it's related to the, to the volume of the, of the spheres and the number of spheres that you, that you have. And now, so let's call this parameter phi. And you can also note that the, if you now take one sphere at random and you ask how many spheres 
are going to overlap with it at the beginning when I put them at random, then this number is just um, eight times phi. So if you want, this, this phi is also a measure of how many neighbors you have at the beginning, so how many uh, constraints, so in this case the constraints are that pairs of spheres should not overlap, so how many constraints you have to, to satisfy essentially. The last example I want to, to show is the, what is called the perceptron problem. It's a very simple problem. You have m vectors in n dimensions. And for each vector, you have a label that is a plus or minus one. So some vectors, so you have, you have a space in n dimensions. You have these points. Some points have a label plus one. So for example, they are blue, and other points are red. And now the question is, you have to find another vector j such that uh, you satisfy this, this constraint so that the, the label sigma is the sign of the scalar product of j with, with y. So, you, you, I mean, you can imagine to, uh, that this is a, a kind of a machine. So this is the simplest uh, machine that you can imagine. It's a machine that has n inputs. Sorry, here, here L is n. So you have n inputs that are the coordinates of your vector. So the machine um, multiplies each of the coordinates by, the, by weight, j. Then you take the sum of all of them. And if the sum is above a threshold, then you say, uh, in this case, the threshold is, is 0. So if the sum is positive, you put uh, plus 1 as the label. And if it's negative, you put minus 1. So it was a machine that was initially inspired by the real biological neurons. But OK, it's strongly uh, simplified with respect to that. And now, um, geometrically, what you're trying to do, you can simply multiply both sides here by sigma, because sigma is plus minus 1, and this is also plus minus 1. This means that you want the product of sigma times this object to be, uh, you want it to be positive, OK? So if you call, if you rename sigma times y, you call it eta, then you, you have now another set of m vectors in n dimensions that are just the, the previous ones multiplied by the label. So you flip them or not, according to the label. And now you want to find the vector in this n dimensional space that has positive scalar product with, with all of the input um, vectors that, that we call patterns now. So it basically means that you want to know if, if it's possible to find a plane such that all the vectors are on the same side of this plane. Well, so OK, so this is a, a very simple, uh, I mean, it's a basically a toy model for machine learning. And it, it gives you an example of a classification problem. So you want to find a machine that is able to separate the, the plus vectors from the minus vectors. OK, so these are three examples. I think you more or less got the, the idea. So uh, what is common in all these problems is that you have some instance that you have to solve. So in the coloring problem, it's the graph that you have to color. In the sphere packing problem, it's the initial position of the spheres. In the case of the perceptron, it's the input patterns. And so given this, this instance that is given to you by someone, uh, then, uh, OK, you, you have um, some size of the instance, which is the, basically the, the, the number of variables that you have in, in your problem. So it can be the number of vertices, or the number of particles, or the dimension of the space. And then you have the variables. So the variables are the color assignments on the vertices or the positions of the spheres or the weights that you have on each coordinate. And you have to solve the problem. And there is some measure of, the, of difficulty that in all cases is given by the number of constraints divided by the number of variables. So in the case of the coloring is the number of, of edges in the graph divided by the number of variables. In the case of the sphere packing is basically the density. And in the case of the perceptron is the number of patterns that you have to classify divided by the, num the dimension of the patterns. So the higher is this parameter, and the intuitively the more difficult is the problem uh, going to be. Uh, now, what is common also to all these problems is that if you try to solve them by brute force, uh, which you can always try to do, it, it takes a time exponential in the size of, of, the, of the problem. For example, in the case of the coloring, one way to solve the problem by brute force is just try, you try all the possible assignments of the colors to the vertices, and, and you stop when you find one that is good, okay, that satisfies the constraints. But then you typically have to numerate. You have Q, Q possible colors on each side, so the number of possibilities is Q to the power n, which is huge, if n is large. So that, that's why people try to understand uh, 
when, I, when, it, when it's possible to do better than, than this brute force approach. And so um, people introduced classes of problems. And so one, uh, okay, so just, I, I'm going to go very quickly on this, and I think you probably all already know about it, but just as a reminder, um, people, I mean, there are many, many classes, but what's, what's interesting for us is what is called the NP class. And this is basically the class of problems that are easy to check, which means if I give you the problem, so if I, if I give you an instance of the problem and I give you, uh, for example, a set of colors on the nodes, so, and, I, and I tell you, okay, this is a solution, you can check if I'm lying or not in time that uh, is scales poly polynomially with the size of the, of the problem. For example, in the case of the coloring, in order to check if a solution is a solution, you have to check for each link if the two colors are different. And this takes a time that is proportional to the number of links. Now, okay, this is, so this is the class of problems that are easy to check. Then there is the class of problems that are easy to solve, and this is called P. And so problems are in P when, for, for any instance of the problem, uh, so for example, in the case of coloring for any graph, there, there is an algorithm that you can prove, can, gives the, can give the answer, yes or no, uh, and if yes, can also give you the solution in a time that scales polynomially with the size of the system. Um, now, a third class that is interesting is the so-called NP-complete class. And these are the problems uh, that are in NP, but they are the most difficult to answer, the hardest in NP. So uh, the definition, of, I mean, a problem is, is, is in NP if, uh, sorry, a problem in NP is NP-complete if any instance of any other problem in NP can be mapped in an instance of A in polynomial time, which means I give you some problem in NP, I give you an instance of that problem, you can map it in polynomial time into a problem in A, so, and then if you are able to solve a, then you can also solve B, okay? So that's why A is supposed to be the, uh, uh, among the hardest problems in NP. So, to, uh, I mean, to, to show it graphically, you can imagine a situation like this. So you have all these huge class of NP problems. These are the problems that you can check in polynomial time. A subset of them can also be solved in polynomial time. But then there is another subset um, that are, that's the, sub, the subset of the most difficult ones. So if you can solve a problem here in polynomial time, then you can solve all of them. So basically you have two possibilities. Either you, either you can prove that you can solve, that there is an algorithm that can solve in, poly, in polynomial time one of the NP-complete problems. And then this means you can solve all <coughs> NP problems in polynomial time, and so P is equal to NP. So here there is just one class. Or you can prove that there is one, um, actually one NP problem, not NP complete, but um, okay, one NP problem that you cannot solve in polynomial time, and then in that case, uh, P is different from NP. Uh, so this is a very famous problem, and uh, I mean, if you can prove one of these two things, you, you, it's listed as one of the most important problems in mathematics, and you get a million dollar prize if you, if you can solve it. Now, the, why, uh, why I mention all this? I mean, this is a very um, beautiful construction. It, it was developed uh, a few decades ago. It's still a uh, subject of a lot of uh, research, especially because people would like to understand this. Um, but it's based on a worst case analysis. So all the statements here are for a class of instances of a given problem. And you, you want the, the statement to be valid for all instances, okay? So in particular for the worst case. Now, what's interesting, uh, I mean, with this uh, uh, caveat, I mean, but what is important about this analysis, I think it's also that it highlights, it highlights the, the importance of some problems, the NP-complete problems that are identified in this way as the most difficult. Okay, now, what was the situation then in the 80s? So in the 80s is the moment when computers start to be really efficient and, and uh, wide, I mean, available, uh, I mean, accessible uh, more easily, at least to researchers. And uh, so people started to do uh, a lot of numerics on this kind of problems and try to solve them on, the, on actual computers. And what they realized is that there was some, some problems. So the, the problem was that, okay, at the time, uh, as I said, there were already, this theory of uh, complexity classes was already well established. And in particular, there were a few problems that were proven to be NP-complete. For example, <clears throat> the coloring, the problem of coloring graphs 
for, for large enough Q was proven to be NP-complete. So if you could uh, solve that one, well, uh, you, are, you are done. You can solve all, all problems in NP. But, um, and OK, so people thought this was difficult. But then when they tried to uh, generate instances of the problem, sorry? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So what, what, I, what I said, sorry, maybe I, I, I was speaking too fast. What I was saying is that so people believed that the coloring was a di very difficult problem. But then when they tried to run it on a computer and uh, so create actual graphs on a computer and color them, they realized that actually you could solve many instances by very simple algorithms. For example, just putting one color at random, then looking to the neighborhood, putting different colors, and, and trying to iterate in this way. So people started to wonder, OK, where are, so, I mean, we know that, that there must be hard instances, because most people believe that NP is not equal to P. So most people believe that there are problems that, that you cannot solve in polynomial time. So where are these problems? How can we construct difficult instances? And so there are these two nice papers that have exactly this title, uh, where, are, where are the really hard instances. And the idea that became uh, popular was to, OK, instead of um, trying to look at single instances, let's try to look to ensemble of instances. Uh, so for example, let's try to take a probability distribution of, uh, over instances that have fixed uh, difficulty. So for example, I told you that there is, a, in, in all these problems, there is typically some parameter that uh, tells you how difficult your problem is, which is typically the number of constraints per variable. So you can say, OK, let's take this parameter to be fixed. So for example, in the coloring case, you can fix the ratio of number of edges divided uh, by the ratio of the number of edges and the number of nodes in your graph. And then you can consider a uniform probability distribution over all possible graphs that have this property. And this. So you call this a random constraint satisfaction problem. So it's an ensemble of, of a random, uh, a, a, an ensemble of random instances of, of this problem. And so it was realized in a series of papers by very different people, including Anderson, um, that this was a convenient way to construct uh, difficult instances and can be used to benchmark algorithms to, to solve this problem. And moreover, that random CSP can be analytically tractable. So this is what I'm going to describe now. So this was the first, uh, these are among the first results that people obtained uh, in the 90s, in the early 90s with computers. So here, th this is what I told you. It's a slightly different problem that I didn't introduce, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, these are instances. So you fix the difficulty, number of edges by, divided by number of variables. And then you, you take, uh, you generate random instances with, with, with a certain size, n. And then you, you run your algorithm, and you try to see if you can find a solution or not. Um, so these are small, relatively small instances. You see up to 100. So you can really run your algorithm until you are sure that either there is a solution or there is no solution. And so you can plot here the fraction of um, instances that, have, that are unsat, that don't have a solution. For, for a given alpha, so for a given difficulty, you change the size of the system, and you see what happens. And what you see is that, OK, when the system is very small, for example, 12 uh, variables, then you have a smooth increase. OK, this is going to increase, of course, with the difficulty. So the more the problem is difficult, and the more it's, it's uh, unlikely that you can find the solution. Uh, but OK, the, the point is that it grows smoothly when n is small, but when n grows, the, 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 um, the growth of this quantity becomes sharper and sharper. Okay? So this looks like a phase transition for, for physicists, um, which means that basically when you are above a certain threshold, here it's slightly above 4, when this, the size of the system goes to infinity, this probability goes to 1. So essentially all instances in the random ensemble are unsat, so they, are, they have no solution. While when alpha is below this threshold, then when the system is very large, with probability uh, one, your instances are, are satisfiable in this ensemble. You can do finite size scaling, so which means instead of plotting things as a function of alpha, you plot as a function of alpha minus four point something, but you multiply by the system size in such a way that you zoom over this region, and you can get a data collapse. So if you get this kind of data collapse, it means that really when n goes to infinity, this curve becomes a sharp uh, jump from zero to one. Um, 
The other thing that was observed is that the running time of the algorithm grows a lot in the vicinity of this threshold four. So here, what you see is the time it takes to to some algorithm. Uh, don't, 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 it doesn't really matter which one, but it's some algorithm that looks for solution. So the time it takes as a function of alpha. So you you see that when alpha is small, there are few constraints. It's very easy to find the solution. When alpha is large, there are many constraints. It's very easy to find contradictions. So you can find, for example, subset of variables that, that have to satisfy contradictory constraints. And so you can prove that, that you cannot find the solution. So in, in both cases, small alpha and large alpha, the algorithm can run quite fast and tell you quite fast if there is a solution or not, except in the vicinity of the threshold. So when you are close to the threshold, you see that when you increase the system size, the time grows very fast. Uh, and and uh, so this looks like critical slowing down in physics and tells you that, OK, you have found a way to construct difficult instances, right? Because now you can just sit at this threshold, so you fix alpha to before, generate random instances of size 10,000, and nobody can solve it in reasonable time, OK? So people were very happy about that. But OK, this was numerics. So then the question was, OK, can we can we we have a phase transition. Can we get some analytical uh, understanding of this phase transition and even some rigorous mathematical understanding of, of this transition? So uh, that's where statistical physics uh, came uh, in the game. And the idea was to uh, use some particular property of, random on, of the randomness in the, in the problem that has been introduced when you move from worst case to random, uh, random CSP. So for example, in the, ca in the case of the coloring, so what, we, what I said is that, okay, wh what I want to do is to fix the difficulty of the problem. So the difficulty of the problem is, again, is the ratio of number of edges divided by number of variables. So it's the connectivity, the average connectivity of a node. So if you take an ensemble of graphs that have fixed uh, average connectivity and are otherwise random, this is the so-called Erdos-Reni ensemble. And it has a, a very important property, which is that loops, so here you have a loop, so when, when the size of the graph grows for this kind of graphs, the length of the loops also grows. So loops, typical loops, are, um, are, uh, have a length of log n. Okay? So this means that if you sit on a site, for example this one, and you look around you, what you see is other sites, and then you see the neighbors of those sites, and so on and so forth, but you don't see loops because the loops are very far. So, from your point of view, the neighbors, your neighbors are very far away from each other, apart from the fact that they are connected by you, okay? But if you remove this site, but then the distance between this site and this site is very large. Now, what we know is that in, in, uh, in, uh, in typical situations, um, correlations between variables decay with the distance, okay? So if you have a variable, if you have something happening here, it shouldn't be too much correlated with something that is very far away in the room, OK? So if you assume that this is true, it's not always true, but if you assume that this is true, then this means that the, the, the um, probability, this, the, the, the properties of these neighbors of the central site are going to be uncorrelated in absence of the central site. So you can use that to solve the model. And I'm not going to go into the details because it would take some time. But this is what is called in physics a mean field model. And you can use this property to, to solve uh, the model. Uh, the same happens in the case of packing uh, spheres in, in a box, where uh, you can play with the dimension of the box. So if you are in two dimensions, of course, the neighbors of a particle are also neighbors. So if you are this particle, these two neighbors are, of course, also neighbors of each other. But when you increase the dimension of space, you move to three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions. Yes. Yes. So, uh, and the critical value for this is what? It depends on the number of colors, but you can, it's finite. It's some number that depends on the number of colors. So Lenka and Florian have a paper where, where you find all the... It's known. It's known. You can compute. I, I, I will show you in a second. Yeah, so I was saying, OK, in the case of particles, you can play the same game, but increasing the dimension of space. So you, instead of looking at 2D, you look at 3D, 4D, 5D. 
Of course, packing spheres in 10,000 dimensions is maybe not something that you're interested in when you want to store oranges, but it's interesting for other problems, and it's a problem that has been studied a lot. Um, and, and well, I don't have time to go into the details, but anyway, uh, so in, in, when, when the dimension increases, you have the same situation. So if you are a particle and you look to, to your neighbors, basically there is a lot of free space around you because the dimension is very high. And so the neighbors are going to be very distant from each other and they're not going to, uh, to talk to each other, essentially. So you can again use mean field theory to, to, to get information on, on the problem. Okay, so to solve these uh, statistical physics uh, mean field models with disorder, people have uh, invented several methods, in particular the replica method and the cavity method. And in this way, you can compute exactly everything about you, almost everything about your system. And I mean, you probably heard the news that, that uh, Giorgio Parisi was awarded the, the Nobel Prize last year for the development, I mean, for the understanding of how to use this replica method to, to compute low temperature states, I mean, solutions, so if you want, of, of these problems. Um, okay, so from this kind of calculation, then you can get all the information, I mean, most of the information that you want on, on typical instances. For example, what is the number of solutions, whether the problem is sat or unsat, so where is the threshold, and so on and so forth. So let me show you uh, an example. So this is from, th from this paper um, of 2007 that solved use this idea to solve exactly the, the, the random coloring problem. So what is shown here is what happens when you increase the connectivity. So you have, a, you have an erdos rheny graph, so you take random graphs, we fix the average connectivity. So the average connectivity is C, number of links divided by number of variables, and you increase the connectivity. And you look to the properties of your uh, graphs. Can you color them or not? So when the connectivity is very low, you typically um, have colorings. Not only you, you typically have colorings, but you typically have many of them, okay? You have a huge amount of solutions, of, co of course. I mean, because if, if your graph is very sparse, you, you have many possible choices. So what is uh, this green blob is in the space of all possible solutions, that is a space of dimension Q to the N, uh, the green points, let's say, are solutions, and the white points are no solutions. So you have this big uh, blob of solutions, and they are exponential. I mean, you have a finite entropy of solutions, so they are exponential in the size of the, of the problem. And on top of that, they form a unique cluster, which means if you start in a solution, and for example, there is a certain side that is red. Now you try to change the color from red to blue. Okay, now maybe there is a neighbor that is blue. So you want to change that neighbor from blue to green. And, and then you propagate the choice, but then you, can, you will have a small avalanche. So avalanches have been mentioned uh, before, but the avalanche will be small and just localized. And you, at some point you stop and you are in a new solution and you just flipped, changed a few colors locally, okay? And then you can move, oh, sorry, you can move from a point to another point, and you can move everywhere in this space by doing a series of these local moves. However, at, at some point when you increase the connectivity, you have a dramatic change in the structure of the space of solutions. So still you have exponentially many solutions, but now they, they form clusters that are separated. And separated means that what I said before cannot be done anymore. So if you try to move, if you start in a solution here, and you try to make local moves, so you change the color and you try to adjust locally, you only can move in this cluster, but you cannot jump to this other one. So in order to jump to this other one, at some point, you need to change the color and then propagate the change, but this will force you to flip, to change a finite fraction, so order n colors, okay, to move to another cluster. And so, but you still have an exponential number of solutions and they, they also form a lot of clusters. So you have an exponential number of clusters in N, each of them containing an exponential number of solutions, except that they are separated by this. I mean, you, 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 you have to make a big avalanche to move from one cluster to the other one. Now, if you keep going, increasing the connectivity, at some point you have another transition that is called condensation where the clusters are not anymore exponential in size, they are now finite, so you typically have a few clusters. 
And then if you keep going, at some point you don't have solutions anymore. So you reach the, the transition that I mentioned before from the situation where typically you have solution to the situation where you typically have no solutions. And this is called the SAT and SAT transition. And there is one more thing that you have some, at some point you can have the appearance of what are called frozen variables, which means that, for example, in one of these clusters, so when the clusters are black, it means there are some frozen variables, which means, for example, there is one, call, one site that has to be red in that cluster. It can only be red. So if you try to change that, that color from red to blue, you immediately move to another cluster, but you have to rearrange the whole uh, coloring that you had done, okay? So you see that there are many, many different uh, transitions, and all these transitions, when n goes to infinity, the size of the system goes to infinity, become sharp phase transition where something jumps from uh, zero to one, okay? Um, and all, all of these things can be computed um, analytically with the, for example, with the cavity method in this paper, and, and, um, and some of them can also be proven rigorously using other methods. Uh, in this paper, we, we did similar things. I mean, not, not all of this, but some, for example, the, the SAT and SAT transition for the case of, um, of uh, spheres, of packing spheres. Now, what does this mean for, now, what we are in, interested in is the, um, it's the, it's what happens to, to algorithms, okay? Because I mean, what we want to do is to understand uh, if we can solve these problems or not. And um, so for the moment, we, we have been talking about the structure of the space of solutions. So what happens to algorithms? Well, there is, for example, there is a nice theorem by uh, Montanari and Semerjan in this paper. And they proved that if you try to use Monte Carlo, which is a popular algorithm to solve uh, these kind of problems, then um, Monte Carlo will not equilibrate above this transition here. So basically, Monte Carlo means you try to move uh, colors at random until you find the solution. And when you are here, you can reach, uh, you can equilibrate and you can reach this uh, space of solutions. When you are above, you are not guaranteed to equilibrate. So you mean not equilibrate fast? Exactly. Uh, what I mean is it takes exponential time in N to, to, to be able to, to sample. This doesn't mean that you cannot find a solution. So it, for example, what, what typically happens is that your Monte Carlo will get stuck into a cluster. And if you are lucky enough, that uh, when you uh, reduce the temperature in Monte Carlo, you, your cluster has a solution at the bottom, you, you will find the solution. But the message of this theorem that I think is important is that the, the, the dynamics of your algorithm that you try to, to use becomes dependent on the details uh, of the algorithm above uh, this, uh, this point. Um, well, now, Still above this point, you can find solutions. Uh, and the, the, I mean, the exact point where a certain algorithm will start to fail depends on the details, more or less for this reason, that there are these clusters. And well, there is a debate on the origin of this, uh, of, I mean, why, when you approach this point, uh, you have this uh, algorithmic hardness. So the time it takes is, is exponential in n. Uh, is, is kind of debated, but it's clear that these clusters play an important role and the presence also of these frozen variables. Now, um, let me skip this. Just to conclude in, in five minutes, I, I wanted to show you uh, an, uh, an attempt that we made with Jean-Philippe and also uh, Marco Tarsi and uh, Dhruv Sharma, who, who was a PhD student and did um, most of the work in this project to, to use these ideas in, in the context of, uh, of modeling of uh, agent-based modeling. So we started again from the perceptron. Um, so the perceptron can be, I, I told you the perceptron is the problem of you have some uh, vectors and you, have, and you want to find a vector j such that the scalar product of j with all these vectors is positive. You can generalize positive by adding some threshold. So sigma equal to zero is the previous case. You can put some sigma. And if sigma is negative, in particular, you have all this phenomenology that I just uh, described when you change the number of vectors that you want to classify. And this was done in a previous, uh, I mean, in a series of works, <laughs> including, I mean, you can check this one for a kind of uh, review, but there were previous works. Now, um, so the idea of using the perceptron in, in um, agent-based modeling uh, was used also in other contexts. What we tried to do was the following. So we, we uh, came up with the observation that 
the, the, the constraint of the perceptron can be thought as a simple budget constraint. So you can imagine that you have M, M agents that, that trade some products, you have N products. So agent mu wants to either sell product I, so the agent has a certain preference, or buy, so if the preference is positive, we, we consider that the agent wants to sell, otherwise that they want to buy. And if you call PI the price of the product, then this quantity is the total profit that the agent would make if um, they are allowed to perform all the transactions that they want to perform, okay? Now, if you, so if you take this price vector and you take the scalar product with the preferences of, of the agent, this is the profit of the agent, and then you have a natural constraint that you want your profit to be bigger than something. But this something can be negative, which means if your agent can, for example, uh, get indebted, then you can allow the profit to be negative. So we thought, OK, well, this looks like a perceptron. So let's uh, think maybe this can have all this phenomenology of uh, clusters. And maybe the clusters could represent multiple solutions uh, to the economic constraints. So we could have an economy with multiple equilibria and uh, non-trivial uh, dynamics between these equilibria. The problem is that in the perceptron, the, the input vectors, so this psi here, are, are, are quenched, which means they are given at the beginning and they don't change with time. While in economy, we know that the preferences of agents evolve in time. So we, we, we wanted to check, do, I mean, do we keep the same phenomenology even in presence of uh, evolving uh, vectors? Okay, so these are the details of the model that are not really important. Uh, what I want to show you here is uh, some time series. So what is shown, okay, the, the only crucial uh, thing is that when, the, when an agent um, for a certain number of periods of time violates the budget constraint, the agent goes bankrupt. So it, it, the agent is killed and replaced by some other a new agent, okay? And in this process, when an agent goes bankrupt, the, there is some debt of this agent and this debt is redistributed somehow on all the other agents. And this is important. So what you see here is the number of agents, the fraction of agents that are going bankrupt as a function of time. Yes. No, sorry, yeah, I was uh, going a bit fast. So, okay, you have this budget constraint that you want to satisfy, but then you want to evolve the preferences. And to evolve the preferences, what we do is we look at the total supply and total demand for a given product and to the price. So the, 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 buy, the, the, the suppliers of a given product update the, their XI in a random way, but looking at, so they try to match supply and demand. So if they see that demand is high, they will increase supply and otherwise. While the buyers, they look at the price, and if they, if they think that the price, if they, the price of a given product is lower than the average, they want more of it, and, and the inverse. So this is how we evolve these vectors uh, xi, and then we have uh, a bit of uh, other details, but that are not very important. And then uh, and on top of that, so at each round we check, and if an agent is consistently uh, doing a very negative uh, profit, then the agent will go bankrupt and be replaced. So what you see here is time, time series of this fraction of replaced agents. I have one minute, uh, Jean-Philippe, right? Okay, I, I will be done in one minute. Um, so what you see is that when sigma is very negative, so you allow a lot of uh, debt, you see a synchronization phenomenon. So there are periods where every, everything is fine and nobody is going bankrupt, and then there are big peaks. And this is something that is kind of related to the previous talk. It's a kind of an endogenous business cycle, and it comes from a synchronization mechanism between the agents that is due to the fact that when someone fails, the, the, the debt that is generated in the bankruptcy goes uh, on the shoulders of all the other agents. So this interaction between agents creates some synchronization that we observe here, and we also observed in other uh, similar models before. Then the, for intermediate sigma, there is a phase where everything is fine, but I mean, there is a unique equilibrium uh, and this quantity is very small. And then you have, when you increase sigma at some point, this quantity becomes very big. So you go to a kind of a trivial phase where everybody's going bankrupt all the time. Um, and what you see here, the last thing I want to show is that when sigma is negative, but, but not, uh, I mean, this is the phase where you have this cri intermediate endogenous crisis. This is the stationary phase. Here you have a, a good anti-correlation between supply, demand, and price. So th this makes kind of sense. And also you have 
for example, if you look to the demand of a given good, for example, here the green, each of these three curves is a good, you see you see strong fluctuations in the in this um, thing. So you have kind of switches between goods that are um, cheaper or, or more expensive. So you have a lot of heterogeneity and fluctuation in, in the model, except that you don't have um, multiple equilibria. You have only one equilibrium. So uh, for the moment, we were not really able to come up with a, a, a way of implementing the model in such a way to have multiple equilibria. But OK, we hope that maybe this can be done in the future. Um, what I think is interesting of this model, be besides the multiple equilibria problem that we don't really have, is the fact that it highlights the importance of tuning the level of depth in the economy. And of course, if you have too, too much, if you are too strict on the depth, then, well, everybody goes bankrupt and it doesn't work. But it, if you are too loose, then you can have this intermittent uh, phenomena with big uh, uh, kind of uh, crisis, like, and I think this is kind of similar to what was uh, mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, well, I think that's it. So, if you are, in, I mean, if you have ideas to to go a bit beyond this, we are happy to talk. Thank you. <laughs>